Love Shoreline! It is so amazing to see all of you here today. Um, so thank you so much. This, this really means a lot to me and to my family. Uh, my name is Lynette Jordan. I am a second generation resident of Shoreline. Um, I went away to college and I lived in Seattle and I came home from college and I lived in Shoreline. It's like, there you go. Um, so I'm very proud of the community I live in. Um, and right now I'm really proud of all of you for representing Shoreline in such a positive manner. So thank you very much. Um, so again, welcome to Stand With Us Shoreline. This um, event was put together by a 13-year-old who unfortunately experienced a pretty horrific um, situation. And because she is such an incredible 13-year-old, she decided to use her voice to share that experience, to provide some feedback about what that experience means to her and how it's impacted her. But more than that, to show that Shoreline is better than that one experience. And so all of you here today is really testament to that. So again, thank you all. Um, yeah. So we are going to have a few speakers. Um, and then we will have our march. We will let you know when it's time to march what the route is. It is very short. Um, so I hope everyone is able to participate in that. All right, we're going to get started. So um, I'm going to introduce my sister, Dawn Jordan, um, who along with Kaylin um, and myself and so many other people have put on this event. Um, Dawn is my little sister, and again, she's a sec you know, second generation resident here um, and very active in racial equity and anti-bias work um, in the greater King County area. And um, honestly, I'm just going to let her speak and use her own words. So again, thank you all so much. This is amazing. Just to echo what my sister said, this is incredible. I am so happy to see so many new faces, um, so many familiar faces. Uh, so many people that I have encountered and my family have encountered through so many um, different ways through Shoreline. This is very overwhelming. Um, the support and direct action that Kaylin and our family has received through this has been overwhelming and outstanding. While one incident has caused this response, we recognize that this is not an isolated incident. There are likely numerous black and brown neighbors who have experiences similar to Kaylin that they have dealt with silently. And today is about making it loud and clear that no one will face these acts of hate and silence alone. Today, enough is enough. So thank you everyone for making time to show up and hold space for not just Kaylin, but for all of our black and brown neighbors and to send a message to our youth specifically that feeling unsafe on our streets, on their streets, is no longer tolerable. Before I turn it over to the beautiful youths we have here with us today, I would like to share some of the reflective thoughts I've had over the course of the last week. It is understood and agreed that said described premises shall not at any time be leased, sold, or conveyed to or occupied by any person other than one of the Caucasian or white race. This was the language of the racial restrictive covenant covering the plot of land called home gardens, what we now call Richcrest. Until 1950, this restriction was legally enforceable, and until housing discrimination became illegal in 1968, this was, and I quote, vigorously and explicitly upheld. And it wasn't until 2006, and after years of resistance from over two-thirds 
of the residents of Ennis Arden that their racial restriction was finally removed. This is your neighborhood. And these are your neighbors. In 1950, my grandfather, a biracial man who passed, purchased a home in Ridgecrest. He and my indigenous grandmother raised five children in Shoreline, an area that until the late 1960s was a part of the sundown zone that included anything north of the Ship Canal Bridge and again was vigorously enforced through violent social means. For three generations, despite racial, racial restrictions and despite the paradox that is living in a, par a neighborhood while never truly belonging, our family has thrived and grown right along the shoreline. We have the privilege of living in a home, a nest egg of stability black and brown families have historically been explicitly excluded from obtaining. The legacy of my grandfather includes a complicated and hurtful history here. But the legacy, the home, and this neighborhood is ours. And ours. This neighborhood is all of ours. And while the support and incredible outpouring of community outrage and love will not fix generations of fearing thy neighbor, what it can and has done is inspire hope and change. So I could continue on with my history lesson here. I could go on about racial disparity, equity, restorative justice, and the need for making sure these big conversations are happening in your homes and all throughout your community. I could talk about the paradox of tolerance and the importance of understanding and challenging symbols that represent brutality and oppression. I could go on about effective tools in deflecting those who question the delivery of the Black Lives Matter message and that magical invisible word only that a certain type of people places in front of that message. I can delve deep into the fear of sending my black child out in the world because I know what's waiting for her out there. These conversations are painful and vital, and I am always down for an uncomfortably productive conversation. Find me and we will have one. But that's not what today is about. Today is about breaking the cycle of exclusionary behavior in Shoreline. Today is about breaking the cycle of never feeling accepted in Shoreline. Today is about breaking the cycle of families being wary of neighbors and scared of what is waiting for our babies on our own streets. Today is about ensuring the showing today is not just a moment but a movement of neighbor accountability and a commitment to ensuring that all of our black and brown families know they belong. Today is about ensuring that our children do not fear becoming a hashtag. Today is about centering our black and brown youths. And today is about letting them know you will show up not just in response to their pain, but to celebrate their magic, joy, and excellence. And we are so fortunate to have some of these incredible youths that continually amaze and impress me, not just in our community, but they are here today. Thank you for being here. Your support means everything to us. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Don. Um, I taught her all of that. Thank you. Um, so our first um, community speaker I'd like to introduce is Darnisha Weary. Darnisha is the co-founder. Yes. Darnisha is the co-founder of Black Lives Matter Shoreline, um, and she is an amazing, strong community um, organizer, and most importantly, a friend to our family. Darnisha. Thank you, guys. I'm happy to be here, but I'm not happy to be here. I'm happy to be here, but I'm angry to be here. Because why do we have to keep having rallies 
Why do we keep having to scream that Black Lives Matter for our neighbors and communities to know? It? So I'm going to start off today by you saying it. And when I say Blue Lives Matter, I want you to say Black Lives Matter. Let everybody that's not here, let them know that Shoreline believes and stands on Black Lives Matter. Are you ready? Because yeah. we're quiet up in here. So whose lives matter? Black Lives Matter! Whose lives matter? Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter in the classroom. Black Lives Matter in the boardroom. Black Lives Matter at your church, your all-white church. Your all white church that can't even say the words Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter is there. Black Lives Matter at your school, your classroom, your teachers, because the woman that did that to Kaylin is somebody's mama. Yes. So she's teaching her children that hate. She's teaching their children that hate, and that is not okay. She's probably somebody's boss. Somebody who saw somebody's resume come through that was black and didn't hire them. She's calling in somebody's board room, making sure that nonprofit doesn't get that grant. You need to disrupt and tell her that is not okay. Because she just represents a lot of others. A lot of others that will do whatever it takes to make sure black lives do not matter. That black lives are taking, and I am tired of it. I'm tired because the black community is the only community that is told to get over it. It's told to get over it when my kids called the N-word in kindergarten and the teacher just like, oh, they didn't know what they were saying. They knew what they were saying because they learned it from mama of the woman who tried to run her over. So don't tell me that they didn't know what they were saying because they heard it at home and it's not okay. So our babies don't need to get over that. That's trash. You, no, my babies do not need to get over that. That's not okay. No other group of people has to go through that, especially in this area. And we're tired. These are, look at our future. These are our babies. You, we need to protect them. This is not okay. I'm tired of it. And when John is talking about the systems, the racist systems, the reason why Shoreline is all right was not by accident. It was by design. And so we need to go into those systems and interrupt and disrupt and overthrow. And there's some systems that just need to go. There ain't no saving them. There's some organizations, there's some nonprofit organizations that just need to close their doors and be done. Because you're not helping anybody but yourself. And we are tired of that. Because black lives will matter. Black lives have always mattered. And we are not going to sit back anymore and let people disrupt and hurt and harm our children so that I have to be the black mama to sit there and hold her and tell her it's going to be okay because y'all don't know how to tell your children to stop talking about them, making them feel inferior, and because y'all don't know how to tell your teachers to stop disciplining our children, stop the prison, the, the school to prison pipeline, go home and study that. You can study that right now. You can hashtag it on Twitter and find that. But when you see that stuff happening in this neighborhood, I need you to stand up and say no. No more. No more. No more. Say no more. No more. Turn to your neighbor, because I'm a pastor's child. Turn to your neighbor. If you've been in the black church, you know. Turn to your neighbor and say no more. No more. We are done. We are done. I hope that you walk away from today and if you are white, you go home and you start researching and start learning about these systems. And you start opening the door and making sure black people can step in, be at the table, and talk at the table and have space. Because what I'm teaching them is to take up space everywhere you go. Because ain't nobody got time to be making. Ain't nobody got time to be waiting because the system's failing. You want to know why the system's failing? Raise your hand if your job has an equity team, if your school has an equity and diversity team. That's how you know the system's failing because you shouldn't need that. You shouldn't need that. Why do I have to have a team to teach my teachers and my job how to value everyone and not make judgment because of what they look? Think about how ridiculous that is. That's ridiculous. We gotta have a team to teach teachers how to te treat black children fairly and not sit in the office because they're not paying attention. Like we gotta do all that. That's ridiculous. And you white people should be mad about that. Don't. That's not a badge of honor for us. That's whack. Yes. That's whack. 
that your job has to have the person to come in and teach your bosses and your human resources how to be equitable in their hiring practices. That's whack, y'all. That's not cute. That's not a badge of honor. So I'm telling you today, research, take up space, disrupt, say something, be loud, be proud. If I would have saw my lady do that to Ken, I would have hopped out of my car and acted a fool up here in Shoreline. And I hope every single one of you will too. That means when you see this crap happening in the street, at Fred Meyer, down the corner, at the park, say something. Because we don't want to be here again with RIP in our shirt. Because that's what's going to happen if you don't stop it. The next gathering we have here is going to memorialize some other black child that didn't make it. That's trash. So I'm begging you and I'm telling you right now, holding every single person that's here accountable. All of you are here. This is not a performance. This is not just so you can show up and have your little sign. You are here to disrupt. You need to go home and do some research. If you've done it, you need to start standing up and saying something and breaking these systems and changing these systems because broken systems create broken adults. And we are tired of dealing with broken adults because that's why we have to keep having rallies every weekend. And I'm tired of having rallies every weekend to disrupt these systems so our children do not become broken adults so we don't have to have more equity teams. I want to work equity team out of being an equity team. I, this is my job. I go around, I work with equity teams. They're like, what's your job? I don't want this to be my job anymore. Just act right. Good Lord, just act right and treat, treat people right, because we're tired. I'm good. Thank you, Darnisha. Um, your words are always very powerful and meaningful, and we really appreciate you speaking um, with us today. So, um, our next speaker is going to be Kaylin Jordan. Um, and I'll just tell you, it's, it's been a blessing to have her in my life, to be part of my family. And let me tell you, I've never been more proud of a 13-year-old than I am of this one's family. Before I share what I have to say here, I want to say that on this day, Emmett Till would be 79, close to the age of some of your grandparents. He was murdered when he was only 14, close to the age of most of the black youth here. Emmett Till is among one of the many of black youth the world failed to protect, whether it's in their own community like Trayvon Martin, or by the people who are supposed to protect us like Tamir Rice, or even the people who are supposed to love and care for us no matter what like Malia Davis. People turn us down all the time, not knowing what we are capable of, and that's their choice. They chose to turn down the black magic and black joy at its finest. Our powerful minds thinking the unthinkable, and our unique imaginations imagining the unimaginable. We're going to be the change that the world needs, even if it's starting small in our own community. Black lives matter, no question. I matter, no question. We matter, no question. Black lives matter even when your fragile white ego says we don't. Black lives matter even when your Insta feed is normal again. Black lives matter even when we have, even when we have to stand alone. You all can stand for me here now today, but will you stand when this happens to someone else? Will you show all the same love and support? You turned me into a hashtag and I'm not even dead yet. You cared about me before I became the next Tamir Rice. You cared about me before I became the next Ayanna Jones. You cared about me before I became the next Trayvon Martin. You all came here without a bullet in someone's brain or a knee in their neck. This is what we mean by protect black youth. You should be able to march alongside us if we have to march. Not for us in remembrance. Don't wait until we die to care. And after this, what will all of you here do? What will you do to make sure we don't have to march in remembrance? How will you protect black youth in your own community? 
How will you make sure we can walk around our neighborhoods without being targeted? How will you make sure we can feel safe in our own homes? How will all the white students we go to school with make sure we aren't in a hate-filled environment? Today's March and Rally isn't just for what happened to me. It's for what black and brown people and black youth go through on the daily in Shoreline. The purpose is bigger than me as an individual. Not bigger than us together, but bigger than me. I'm so lucky that we were able to plan this in less than a week with the help of so many people in this community. If there, have been, if there, have, if there is anything I've learned in this past week is that we can only fix the world together, not divided. People will say, if it's your problem, it's not mine. It's a black people's problem, it's a woman's problem, it's a poor people's problem. Well, how many of us here have friends and colleagues from different races, genders, and religions? Show of hands. Well, then you know they want to break bread with you, right? You're friends with them. You love music created by them. You love your culture. You love their culture. Well, if you love them, then this is your problem, too. So when we're marching, when we're protesting, when we're posting about the Trayvon Martins, the Atatiana Jeffersons, and the George Floyds of the world, tell your friends to pull up and stand with us, because this is their problem, too. This is my child. This is my child. All these babies back here. All the babies out there. And I don't have to experience the things that she might experience. How do you think that makes me feel? I stand here. I stand here. I gotta defend these people. I gotta stand in front of you guys. I gotta sit in classrooms and watch teachers slowly talking and seeing kids slide down in their chairs because everybody's looking at them. It is oppression in classrooms. Whether you see it or not, your kids are coming home and they are experiencing it. When you're out here in our communities, in the grocery stores, further south, further north, there are families like she and I everywhere. Everywhere. How many times have we been asked, is that your mom? Yes, that's my mom. We have a beautiful recipe in front of us. Everybody, we have a recipe for existence. Be a part of that existence that everybody can prosper. You think mamas back here want to fear that their kid can't walk down the street? That's not okay. It's not just in the media. We're all here for that reason. We're done with it, right? Are we done? Because I don't want to sit here, just like Donnie just said, I don't want to sit up in here and try to tell y'all how to treat people that don't look like you. Or you have to tell people to treat people kindly. If you don't know God, you need to know something inside your heart that treats you well enough to say, yes, I want to help and I want to love. Because love is kind, it is beautiful, and it is strong. And here together in this community right now, we're going to be strong for our children, for your friends, for your peers, and your community. We have to do this. And it is not fear that we're relying on a certain skin color to stand up and say, stop shooting at me. Stop hurting me. Stop talking about slavery and textbooks in my classroom. And I got to go out there sitting with my friends. My daughter got to go sit with her friends. Learned about that stuff. There's more to it. Native American history. Japanese American history. You want, I'm asking you guys, all of you here today, to challenge the curriculum. Please. Please challenge the curriculum. That's where it's going to change. You have a voice. The vote, the vote, the vote counts. So make it count. Make your voice travel further than just here and the signs and the hashtags. Please. We have to commit to justice. We have to know peace. And it only will come by community. Community is power. Togetherness is power. Thank you.